So, well, it is good to see you this morning. Glad that you are here. I would ask that uh, if you think about it this week, if you could also uh, just say a little prayer for me as well. I'm supposed to have some shots in my knees this week. Uh, hopefully hold surgery off a little longer. So uh, if you could do that, I would appreciate it greatly. But I want to introduce to you somebody, uh, a, a couple that have been married for just over a week. I was going to introduce them last week, and I completely lost my mind. But uh, would you please congratulate Wade and Madison Lundeen right down here. And I am overjoyed to say that they're still married, right? Okay. They're sitting together, so I'm assuming they're still married. But it's great to have you here this morning. And uh, it's, uh, it's just a wonderful time. So, but we have had a great week. We had a seniors luncheon on Wednesday. In fact, it went so well that we're trying to think of more opportunities to bring that group together. We had great food. We had great fun. We had wonderful fellowship. Um, if you're a senior and were not able to join us this past week, then I hope that you can be with us the next time we get together because we are going to do this more often. It's a, it's a fun group, and uh, so we're going we're gonna to plan more items like this. Well, this morning we are going to begin the third week of Advent as we are looking at the question, Why Mary? The first week we tried to answer the question, Why Jesus Became a Man? Last week, we tried to understand why Joseph, and then this week, why Mary? Mary, the mother of Jesus, is, is probably known better than any other female in the Bible. She's been the best-known woman in the world since the days in Bethlehem, and after centuries, that statement probably still holds true. The angel appeared to Mary and, and told her this in Luke 1, 28. He says, The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Every person that is in the Bible has their own story. And these stories are not necessarily there so that we can learn about them particularly but instead to learn about their walk with God, their relationship with God, how they responded to situations with God. And, and there's so much that we can learn from Mary as we try to answer the question, why Mary? But I think that we need to look at the characteristic with Mary of godliness or the relationship that she had with God. And one of the first things that we see in Mary's life is that Mary teaches us the submission of godliness. Submission of godliness. In Luke 1.38, we find these words. It says, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. From the very beginning of Mary's relationship with Jesus, with God, it, it was all about submission. When the angel Gabriel came to Mary with the news that she was to be the human mother of the Messiah, Mary had no early warning of this. She had no preparation time. She, had, she did not have a timeline. There was no precedent set. This had never happened before. She had no clue of, of what was going to take place. She really had no clue what it meant to be the, the earthly mother of the Messiah. The entire dialogue between Mary and the angel took place in Mary's home. And when the angel came and spoke to her, Mary learned she would bear a son and that his name would be Jesus. And she was told that his birth would be unlike any other child ever born. She was to have a child without having a relationship with a man. He would be a child of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and we see how Mary responded to that news that, that she was to become the mother of the Messiah. She said, may your word be fulfilled in me. In other words, Lord, I don't understand this. I don't comprehend it. It doesn't make any sense to me. I, I don't have a, a template of anybody to go for and to say, well, this is how it used to be done. But whatever you desire, be it unto me according to your word. That is submission. Now, Mary must have wondered in her heart, why, why have I 
been favored to be the mother of Jesus? Why me? I mean, there's a lot of other women around. Why would you choose me? And the reason that she was chosen are not told to us in Scripture. They're, they're known only to God himself. But it's clear from studying Mary's life that then what little information that we have about her beforehand that she was no random selection. She was an ordinary small town girl. She would be obedient. She was courageous. We do see that she was a woman of scripture, a, a woman of faith. She would be a, a virgin that the glory of God might be miraculously demonstrated in. She should be a, a peasant in keeping with the humble nature of Lord's birth. Mary was all of these things. She honored and obeyed the will of her father, providing his only son a home, which he would emerge from to launch the work that would define all the human history. And the baby Jesus followed her around, much like all of you moms who have small children at home. They, they just follow you around, seeing what you're doing, what's next. And, and then in time, she walked behind him. In fact, she walked behind him all the way to the cross, all the way to the tomb. Mary teaches us the submission of godliness. There comes a moment when God asks each of us to do something that we should obey and follow through with. And we face the same dilemma that Mary did. Will we accept that or will we turn from it? When God asks us to do something that, that may be hard or, 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 or certainly that we don't understand, our prayer should be that we will rise up in obedience with the words of Mary. May it be unto me according to your word. Lord, whatever you want, I'm your servant. I will do what you ask me to do. If you've been fighting with something God has been asking you to do, let me ask you to just go back and learn the submission that Mary shows us here, the godliness and let your words be hers. Lord God, let it be to me according to your word. I will do that. I will do what you tell me to do. That's where joy comes in. If, if Mary was just simply a happy person, she would not have followed along with this. Because what God was asking her to do was not going to bring happiness into her life. But when she had the joy inside of her, that opportunity, that relationship she had with God, when God comes to you and says, I want you to do something, we can say, I don't understand it, Lord, but I submit to you and I will do this because of the joy that lives inside of us. The second thing we learn from Mary is that Mary teaches us the surprise of godliness. She not only teaches us submission, but now she teaches us the surprise of godliness. The adventure of walking with Jesus Christ is the greatest adventure that we will ever know. To know that we are related to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, that the Creator of the universe has sent His Son to live within us, to live within our lives that we have direct communication to an almighty God, that, that we can have fellowship with him, that he will direct us, he will guide us, he will strengthen us, he will be with us, that surely is a great adventure. But it's also full of surprises. Can anyone say amen to that? Have you ever been surprised by what God has brought before you? You ever got up one day and God says, hey, I want you to do this. And you say, well, that was a surprise. Didn't expect that. But I want you to know, even though it may be a surprise for us, it's never a surprise for God. He always knows what's going to be next. The word of God tells us that when we walk with the Lord, he doesn't always give us the information about the future that we desire. It, it's sort of like a need to know basis. And that was the way it was with Mary. Mary's whole relationship with Jesus Christ was a relationship of surprises. When Gabriel made his startling announcement to Mary concerning the birth of Jesus, this is how Mary first responded in Luke 1.29. It says, Mary was greatly troubled. 
at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. I think if they were writing that about me, they could use words stronger than greatly troubled. I, I, what do you, what do you, how do you handle that? Mary had no preparation for this assignment. God just simply came to her, surprised her with the message of his plan for her life. And when the shepherds told Mary and Joseph what the angel had told them while they were out in the field, she became quite pensive, very quiet. In Luke 2, 18 and 19, we find these words that tell us, And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to her. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary collected all of these truths that the shepherds were telling her and deposited them within the deep recesses of her heart. She did not discuss them with anyone else. She thought them through only by herself. Have you ever had a moment when God has spoken to you or something has happened that you can't explain and it has caused you to just pause and ponder what God has said? And like Mary, we often find ourselves surprised in our walk with God. And like Mary, we do not have a blueprint for our lives or for those of our children. But when we submit to the Lord by faith, we discover he is always there for us. He is always there with us. He hears our prayers. He meets our needs. And while it may be a surprise to us, God is not surprised by any of it. And while we say, I don't understand it, I don't know where this is going, I don't know how this is going to come out, God says, just trust just allow me to guide and direct you, and I will. The third thing we see from Mary is that Mary teaches us the suffering of godliness. Mary taught the submission of godliness, the surprise of it. But finally, we need to pause from the joy and the gladness of Christmas and remember that Christmas is only meaningful in light of the fact that it is the beginning of and not the end. Christmas by itself is a magnificent story. It's a, it's a huge story. But when you put Christmas together with Easter, when you realize that the cradle and the grave have a straight line drawn between them, then Christmas becomes much more profound and even more meaningful. Because Mary teaches us the suffering of godliness and that we move from the announcement of Jesus' birth to the agony of his death. Because there's no reason for the cradle if there isn't any cross. And so the transition from the birth of Jesus to his death is a normal and natural one. Jesus Christ was born to die. That's why he came to this earth. And Jesus made seven distinct statements from the cross in his dying hour before he gave up his spirit to the Father. And those seven statements are found in all the Gospels. And the first word from the cross is this. It's found in Luke 23 and 34 where it says, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. That's a prayer that Christ ask for his father to do for us while he was still being crucified on the cross the second word is this found in Luke 23 43 Jesus answered him truly I tell you today you will be with me in paradise that's a word of forgiveness to the repentant thief who was hanging next to him on the cross the fourth word is Matthew 27 46 and this is what it says. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A word of resignation spoken to the Father in heaven. The fifth word comes from John 19, 28. And this is what it says. When he had received 1928, later knowing that everything had now been fulfilled and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. 
The sixth word is found in John 19, 30, where it says, When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And the seventh word is found in Luke 23, 46, which says, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Now, some of you might have caught the fact that there were seven, and I neglected to mention number three. The third word of Jesus is found in John 19, 26 and 27, where he says, When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, his disciple took her into his house. In the last moment of Jesus' life here on earth, he turned his thoughts away from the events on the cross to concern for his mother. Around the cross that day, there were the onlookers, the bystanders, the critics of our, our Lord were there, those who had mocked him with their words. Some had heard him say, if you are the Son of God, save yourself and come down from the cross. The chief priests, the scribes, and, and the elders of the Jews pointed their fingers at, at him and said, If you're the Christ, save yourself. And some of Jesus' friends were also there. And John mentions some who were present that day. And Jesus turned to John in one of the last moments on the cross, concerned himself with the well-being of his mother, Mary. And the scripture says that when they left the place of crucifixion, John took Mary to his own home. Jesus' first three words from the cross were about others. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Today you will be with me in paradise. And John, that's your mom. Take care of her. And as we think back through the life of Jesus and his mother, we identify with, with what they have experienced. In fact, the Christmas story, there is prophecy that makes us look into the crucifixion. Do you remember when Jesus was taken to the temple by his parents and presented to Anna and Simeon? It's found in Luke 2, 34 through 35, where it says, Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Those words recorded by Luke were spoken by Simeon when Jesus was an infant, was presented to Simeon and Anna in the temple. And now the Bible says that, that Simeon took Jesus in his arms and blessed God, and then Simeon turned to Mary and prophesied the words that we just read. And he told Mary that her child would be the cause of much sorrow and much pain in her life. And Simeon spoke of a sword piercing through her own soul. The prophecy was given 33 years before the crucifixion. But it was fulfilled as Mary watched her son being beaten and nailed to the cross. Mary knew more pain in her life than most of us will ever know. She knew about the godliness of suffering. The day Jesus was crucified, Mary experienced the fulfillment of Simeon's words and a sword pierced through her own soul. James Stalker has written a number of books concerning New Testament truth and, and on the life of Jesus. And in one of those books, he was describing this moment in Mary's life as she stood before the, the cross and during the crucifixion. And he wrote, there Jesus hung before her eyes, but she was helpless. His wounds bled, but she dared not touch them. His mouth was parched, but she could not moisten it. The nails pierced her as well as him. The thorns around his brow were a circle of flame around her heart. The babe of Bethlehem, the boy of Nazareth, the brawny workman of the carpenter shop, the gentle man of Galilee, the teacher without equal, the mighty man of merciful miracles, the humble man of patience and grace, her own son is now writhing before her own eyes in the throes of agony and defeat. Jesus grew up just like any of our children did. And those memories of his early days no doubt played throughout her mind as she stood watching the awful apparent ending of his life. 
And that was all a part of Mary. She remembered those moments. The hands and the feet that she held when he was an infant were now nailed to the cross. And the disciples would leave her. Her friends would forsake him. The nations would reject him. But his mother was there until the very end. And in these two snapshots of Mary, his birth and his death, we're reminded that God wants us to learn from the people of the Bible. And from Mary, we learn the submission of godliness, the surprise of godliness. And then a lesson we would rather not learn, the suffering of godliness. But that's a part of life. We either embrace it and learn from it, or we spend our entire existence on this earth fighting against something which we can never overcome. Our Lord suffered, Mary suffered, and we will also experience the suffering that comes with living. We have to learn from this godly woman, and, and here's the remarkable thing as it relates to Mary. Mary was the mother of Jesus. Remember this, Mary was the earthly mother of Jesus, but she needed Jesus to be her savior as much as anyone else. She was the mother of Jesus, but she needed Jesus to be her savior. The Magnificent reveals this truth. Luke 1, 46 and 47 says this. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Now, the thing we have to understand and the thing we need to take away with us this morning is that none of this could have happened for Mary if she was not filled with the joy of the Lord inside of her. If it was just happiness, if she was just a happy person, none of this could have taken place. None of this would have happened. But because she had the joy, because she had the submission to God in her life and that relationship with God, all of this took place. And we gather here this morning on this third Sunday of Advent, and we have a focus of joy, and we speak about Mary. Because Mary was the one who had the joy in this story. In spite of everything that was going on, in spite of everything that would be before her that she didn't know about, Mary was still a woman of joy. And as fantastic as this, as fantastic as this is, the Savior who was born in the womb of Mary had to be born again in the heart of Mary. And if you and I want to receive joy, if you and I want to be have filled with joy in this Christmas season, the only way that that can happen is not by the gifts that you receive next Sunday morning or two Sundays from now. It's not from all the lights and the trappings and the food and all the candy out there on the table. You could eat all that candy out there on the table if you wanted to, but it is not going to bring joy. It's just not. The only thing that's going to bring joy is a relationship with Christ. Mary found that out. Out of all the things that she went through, it was the joy that was a matter of Christ brought that. And the Savior whose birth we celebrate during this season is a Savior who must be born in our hearts as well. And he comes into our hearts when we ask him to. He will not come unless he's asked. And I need to ask you the same question that I've asked you for the last two weeks. Is Jesus Christ in your life? Is he active? Is he alive in your life? Is he the one who brings joy to you? Is he the one who gets you up in the morning and you can face each and every day because of the joy that's inside of you. If he is, then praise the Lord. If he's not, then I would ask that you cry out to him and say, Lord, I need that joy in my life. That's the only way you're going to enjoy this Christmas season, is making sure that he's a part of who you are. Would you stand with me?
over these last two weeks, we have, we have recounted the story of Joseph and where Joseph made the statement that anytime, anywhere, Lord, I'll do what you ask me to do. When he agreed to take Mary as his wife, that was what Joseph was saying. Anytime, anywhere, I'll do whatever you ask me to do. We look at Mary today and realize that when the angel came to her and told her she was going to be with child, she didn't run away. She didn't say there's, not a, there's no way possible. She said, may it be unto me as you have said. And that's really what Christ is asking of all of us in this Christmas season. Will we submit to him? Will we follow him? Will we ask him into our hearts when it doesn't make sense? Will we accept him into our life and say, Lord, I need you today. I need you to be the Lord of my life. I need you to give me the strength. I need you to bring the hope and the peace and the love and those that can only be attainable if joy is, comes with it and is there first. So Lord, I ask for those who are gathered here this morning, for those who may be watching us right now, who those may be watching us throughout the week, I ask this question, is joy within you? And before you say that, say, and before you say, well, yeah, there's joy in me, I want you to know that the joy that I'm talking about can only be attainable because you've asked Jesus Christ into your life to forgive you of your sins and to know that when our time here is done, that we will spend eternity with him in heaven. That's the joy that I speak of. I simply want you to just ask yourself a question. Is that the joy within you? Is that where your joy comes from? If it is, then I'm going to ask you to pray for those who may be in the congregation this morning, those who may be watching who do not have that joy. And I ask that you would pray that they would have the strength to be able to step out and to come forward and ask Christ into their life because it will make a world of difference in how you celebrate the Christmas season. You can celebrate Christmas however, but the only true way of celebrating is knowing that you have the joy of Christ in your life. So we're going to wait just a minute. If you need that joy, if you seek that joy, if you desire that joy, then I'm going to ask that you simply step out and come to an altar and just ask God to give you that joy. Have someone come along beside of you and just pray for you. So if you need the joy of Christ in your life this morning, come and spend just a few moments at the altar as we close this morning. Lord, this time of year, they have different networks have the 25 days of Christmas, 25 days of, of movies and feel-good things that they play, and, and they think that's what's going to bring joy to your life. 
have all kinds of stores advertising and telling you this is a gift that you need for Christmas. This is what you need. Get this for your loved ones. They say that'll bring you joy. That'll bring you peace. But Lord, none of those things will bring the, the joy that Mary had in her life to be able to sustain everything that took place in her life. From the joyful moment of, of Jesus' birth to the painful, agonizing end of Jesus' life on earth. It's only that joy from asking you into our life that will fulfill it, that will truly give us a joyful Christmas time. So, Lord, I, I just pray. I pray for this one who, is, who has come this morning, and as they gather around him this morning, I, I pray that that joy will fill him this morning. It will be a lasting joy. It will be a joy that, that will last for his entire life and will continue on when, when he meets Jesus face to face. But Lord, I also pray for those who are not able to step out this morning. Just we're fighting against that. And I, and I just pray, Lord, that you continue to speak to them today. Continue to help them to see that joy the acceptance of you into their life will bring what they seek more than anything else. May they meet you this day, Lord. So, Lord, now I ask that you would just release us all with your benediction and your blessing, Lord, that you would travel with us throughout this week, that you would just fill us with joy throughout this season, and may it be something that we can pass on to those around us. And we ask these things in your precious son's name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. God bless. Go with joy this morning. Spend that joy and spread that joy to those around you in this coming week. God bless.